Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast with your host, Johnny Gorky. You have the power to overcome challenges and fears. Let my voice and the voice of many others show you how to transform these challenges into opportunities. To learn more about future podcasts and read episode show notes, check out my website at www.thepowerofyourvoice.com. Welcome back to the Power of Your Voice podcast. This is episode 61 with Oodles Erasmus. Oodles is the founder of Oodles Choice. It's now found in Whole Foods and other health food stores worldwide. He invented the machinery for making oils, enzymes, and probiotics, and more. Oodles first pioneered flaxseed oil and the healthy fats industry. Oodles is an acclaimed author, speaker, and expert on total sexy health. He has a eight-step process that takes into consideration all of the elements of the whole health that include our mental health, presence, and awareness, our life energy, and being in harmony with nature and humanity. He has given 5,000 live presentations on nutrition and health, has done over 3,000 media interviews, over 1,500 staff trainings, and has traveled to over 30 countries with his message on oil, health, nature, and human nature. Udos has sold over 250,000 copies of his numerous books, including Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill, originally, which was published in 1993. Udo had an extremely rough childhood growing up in a war zone and living without water, electricity. In 1980, Udos got pesticide poisoning and his doctors did not know what to do with him. Udo decided to take his health into his own hands and through deep research, he made discoveries that changed the trajectory of his life and purpose. Udo is a teacher at the Tony Robbins events on oils and Deepak Chopra on peace. He has keynoted an international brain health conference and lectured at conferences on five continents. Udo has an extensive education in biochemistry, genetics, and biology, and nutrition, as well as a master's degree in counseling psychology. His latest focus is on sustainable energy and water management, as well as healthcare based in nature and human nature, and the thirst of heart resulting in total health. Welcome to the Power Your Voice podcast, Udo. It's great to have you on, sir. Hey, my pleasure. Thank I you. I love doing these. Thank you. And You've done quite a few. <laughs> I've done a few, yeah. I've, so, I've, I've done a lot of uh, talks, actually, live talks, but that's not, we're not in the season for, for live talks these days. That's definitely true. Many of us, we've claimed, oh, you know, I've, I've had a rough childhood based on some degree and experiences, mm-hmm. but your experience is completely different. Can you tell our listeners, how was your childhood growing up, especially in World War II in Poland? completely different i I, I try to remember as little of it as possible (laughs) i was born my parents were from latvia and estonia their their life basically in europe was first world war then the bolshevik revolution which was really hairy then the depression and then the second world war so that was their life in europe and they and it's just like they just followed one another they were ended up going to poland I was born in Poland when it was part of Germany during the Second World War in 1942. And at the end of the war, we were refugees who were trying to get the hell out. And it was basically my father was not there. My, my mother was by herself with six children, six and under. And they were fleeing out of Poland into Germany with the communists chasing them in trucks and tanks and on roads that were just had, just had refuges on them. They were all in hay, uh, horse-drawn hay wagons. The horses weren't getting fed because there wasn't time for that. They weren't getting watered. It was like really a mess. And it was all just filled with, with refugees. And the allies, the good guys, were using us as target practice. So we, we had it coming from the back and coming from the front. Okay. They were shooting, the, our allies were shooting us from planes. I was not quite three. I just remember the fear, the anxiety, the chaos, nothing to count on. Every day was different. 
one day you got told one thing and next day you got told another thing. And I remember being hungry. Uh, my sister remembers dead horses and dead people in the ditches. And my mother, eventually the, the wagon broke down and the horse, you know, so she, she took off across the fields. She had to leave four kids behind. I was one of the kids left behind. And I can't imagine what it must be like for a mother to have to make a choice like that. But it wasn't, you know, but for the kid, it wasn't, wasn't exactly very nice either. And so I grew up really very, very shy. I was so shy that if I had to talk in class, I would find a reason not to go to school. So if I had to do a presentation in class, I would not go to school because I, I couldn't handle having more than two eyeballs looking at me. Now, how are you able to overcome that? Because that, that's a big challenge for people. Yeah, um, which, is, yeah which is kind of funny because I actually make my living on stage now. <laughs> right well, it's and and there were two things that happened one was that i got to a point when i was in my 20s first of all i i went into when it came to education i read a lot of books and i really wanted to understand how things work because i didn't know what i could count on but if you know how something works then you can count on it right so i studied science and then i studied biological sciences and I studied uh, psychology, and I did a lot of self-knowledge work just, just to, to understand who I am and what I function like and what, what am I made of. And so that was one way. I did a lot of reading because it was safe. I never felt safe when I was a kid. Uh, so I read a lot of books, got pretty knowledgeable. Books are safe, right? <laughs> Nothing ever jumps out at you at a book. <laughs> Nobody ever shoots at you from a book, right? <laughs> even if they're talking about shooting, it's, they're not shooting at you. So it's very safe. And I got to one point where I realized that I was ashamed of myself and my body. And the way I figured that by this time I was 26 and I was still just, still just a shy, like I would stand in front of my, my professor's door and I would have a converse, you know, instead of knocking on the door and going in and having a conversation, I would stand outside the door hesitating and having the whole conversation, including his answers, in my head. <laughs> and then finally, I'd have the conversation. And uh, his answer to, to my question wasn't what I imagined in my head. It would be completely different. And I was okay in the conversation after that. But to get the courage to even knock on the door was like a super ordeal for me. Then I realized I, I was ashamed of my body. And, I, and it didn't make any sense. I studied biology and there's nothing wrong with bodies, but I had this thing as I'm ashamed of my body. So I decided instead of trying to talk myself out of it, I would just become comfortable to be naked in public. And so out of that, I started <laughs> a nude beach. And the way it went, as I went down, down to the beach, sat down behind a log, took my clothes off, sat there, and somebody would come by, I would duck. <laughs> I got to a point where if there was nobody on the beach, I would walk around naked on the beach. And if somebody came, came by, as soon as I saw them coming, I'd go down, sit, sit down behind the beach again, uh, sit down behind the log again, right? And then it wasn't too long before I'd be walking naked down the beach and somebody came and I would just keep walking. And I did that for two years. And after two years, this guy came, he was closed and I was naked. This is a, a and, and I'm going one way, he's coming the other way. And he yelled at me re, in, in the top of his voice, put your clothes on. <laughs> and I yelled back at him in the same loud voice. <laughs> I'm not telling you to take yours off. Don't tell me to put mine on. And at that point, the thought went through my head. Okay, I'm okay with naked now. So <laughs> that, that took me two years. Wow. I'm comfortable naked and I'm not ashamed of my body. Because the whole idea of it was stupid. Right? Where do you come up with the idea that you should be ashamed of your body? Either somebody told you you should be and you, you bought it. You know, but there's nothing wrong with any body, even, even if it has, you know, if, even if there are toenails missing or even if the nose is crooked or even, you know, all the things, you know, yeah, I got a zit on your face or whatever it is, right? Yeah, it's very interesting because, yeah, just like what you're saying, 
sometimes we might think, well, somebody needs to say your body is unattractive in order yeah, to yeah. feel that way. You're so ugly. <laughs> yeah, but something. it's not always true. Maybe it's because something you've experienced other people say to somebody else and you overheard it and you thought it might apply to you as well. Or maybe through like media or looking at magazines or what we see on TV, we kind of assume that this is how we're supposed to look like. And that's why we kind of think this way, you think? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, when I was a kid, I would, look at the, I would look at the mirror. When I was a teenager, I would look in the mirror and I would find something to criticize about my face, right? So I didn't see the whole face, you know, I just saw the zit, right? <laughs> right? And, and, and it's because I didn't feel good about myself that I was doing that. When I started, began to feel good about myself, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, when I started feeling good about myself, I looked at the same face and I would say, not bad. Because, and, and I realized that why I didn't feel good about myself wasn't based on what I looked like. It was based on not feeling good inside, not feeling whole inside, not feeling present inside, because when you're present inside, you actually feel whole. But I was never present inside. I was always in my head. So my, all of my input came out of my head, not from experience, but out of my head, right? And so in my head, somebody said, you're ugly. And because I didn't feel good about myself, I, I would, you're ugly, right? And I, so I'd go into this whole thing, right? And eventually when I started feeling good, because I did get present in my own experience, somebody said, you're really ugly. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite beautiful, right? And it just changed because my experience of myself changed. So the other thing is I was really shy. I wouldn't go to school. And you, you asked, well, how did I overcome that? Uh, what happened to me was I was 38. I got poisoned by pesticides. I was careless. I, my, my marriage broke up and I was careless. And so I got poisoned by pesticides. And I was looking, I went to the doctor. He, doctor she said, uh, we don't have anything for pesticide poisoning. So I started taking my background in biological sciences and biochemistry and genetics and all that stuff that I had studied and started saying, well, I, I guess I'm going to have to take it on myself. And I started reading in the journals and I found out, first of all, the body's made out of food, water, and air, nothing else in nature. So I started looking at food, you know, nutrition and, uh, and food, disease and food, water, air. So I started looking at all of that and uh, found out that fats cause more health problems than anything else in nutrition. Because in from the fats, we get essential fatty acids, and they're super, super sensitive to damage by light, damage by oxygen and damage by heat. And when they're made by industry, they're damaged maybe around 1%. And in a tablespoon, you get more than a million damaged molecules for every one of your body's 60 trillion cells. And when I found that out and I said, I can't get healthy on oils like that, they should be made with health in mind. And then a stupid thing, <laughs> I'm going to do it, <laughs> right? So I actually developed a method for making oils with health in mind. And then the year after I got poisoned, it, it, was, it was established that omega-3s are essential. And essential means you can't make it from anything else in your body. So it has to, you have to get it from outside. If you don't get enough, your health goes down. It gets worse with time. And if you don't get enough long enough, you die. So this, these are the essential building blocks for body construction. And... And the third part of the definition is that if you're going down because you're not getting enough, but then you bring in enough into your body, then all of the problems that come from not getting enough are reversed. And you get your health back because life knows how to build a body that works, provided we take responsibility here to make sure that all of the building blocks land in the body in optimum quantities, if optimum health is what we what we want to do. So we have a lot of power over health right here. Definitely. So 
<clears throat> so, and then I found out 99% of the population doesn't get enough omega-3 for optimum health. So that meant every, because every cell needs them, they're a nightmare to work with because they're very, very sensitive. But it means there must be lots of things that are not working for people as well as they could because they're not getting enough of this one essential nutrient. And that was only established in 1981, the year after I got poisoned. I got so excited. I got so excited. You, you could have peeled me off the ceiling. I got so excited, <laughs> right? Because I said, oh my God, if we could make oils with health in mind and we could bring the omega-3s that are too low back into the population, we could help so many people. And the, and the, the, the excitement that I felt from seeing how much good I could do for people dragged me through all of my shyness and all my fears about, and then I started talking and my mouth was dry. And then somebody said, hey, when you're afraid of talking, pay attention because you will find out that if you're just concerned about yourself, how do I look? And what if they, you know, what if I screw up or if, what if somebody contradicts me or what if I'm wrong or what, you know, if you're thinking about how you look, you're going to be nervous. But if you focus on just delivering your message, your present, your gift to your, to your, the people that are listening to you, then you will not be nervous. That's really interesting, right? So then I, I, I experimented sitting in a chair in my room and pictured people in front of the room. There was nobody in the room except me. <laughs> Pictured people and started thinking about what if, what if I screw up? What if they contradict me? What if somebody takes, you know, takes me on? What if somebody gets mad at me? And I would adrenalize myself just by those thoughts about myself sitting in a chair in a room with nobody else <laughs> present. And then I would focus on, oh, let me tell you about the about the importance of omega-3s. Let me tell you how, how many things can get better when you take them, which was the message, right? And the moment that I switched from being about myself to being about serving, be helping people, my adrenaline would disappear. And then on stage, the same thing happened. Before I got up, I said, oh my God, oh my God, what if, well, you know, and it was all about me. And the moment I opened my mouth, two sentences into presenting something of benefit to them, my nervousness completely disappeared. And now I'm to the point, I've, I've given thousands of talks now, like 5,000 probably, maybe, well, I've more than that actually, and done 3,000 media interviews. And uh, just in the last year, I've done about 150 podcasts, right? But so these days, I get on stage, I got no butterflies. I just have a message. And because I focus on the message, instead of focusing on the butterflies, the butterflies have left the building, <laughs> right? That's so that's how, that's how I got through all of my shyness and all of my fears and all of that stuff. Simply because I found something that I felt was so worth doing. It was like having a purpose for your life. That, that, you know, and then I, you know, I mean, I started and I had a dry mouth when I started talking. That went away pretty quick. And then just with practice, 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 I've literally, when I know what I'm talking about, I have zero fear. You know, even people sometimes say, oh, you should be a little nervous because you'll be a better speaker. It's not true. It's not true. You want to be, you want to be in your, in your power. You want to be in your presence. And but you want to be there to deliver something of value to people. So the question for me is like, how can I help people? What can I do that helps people the most? That's what I want to do. Or that helps the most people in the greatest possible way. What's the biggest splash I can make for good in the time that I have on earth? That's basically, that's a really good question to ask, right? And then that'll depend on who you are and what your experiences are and, and what your talents are and what you have, you know, uh, what you're interested in. 
it's like you, you're talking about, you know, you've taken something that was a, that was a challenge for you. I checked you out a little bit, right? But you did something that's a challenge for you, and now you're using that to, to, to help people. How cool is that? Yeah, well, I, I was going to ask you, yeah, because that's the thing. It's like you found something that you're extremely passionate about. Yeah. And you just go with that, and then all the other stuff just disappears, which is just incredible. So for somebody yeah. who's listening, it's like maybe what they're doing is may, maybe not the thing that they're extremely very passionate about but when you find something you absolutely love and you're so convinced <laughs> that that's what you're meant to do that's your purpose then it just it comes natural for you which is just beautiful yeah yeah and and how do you find your passion i i think the biggest issue there is and i actually did that before i started before i got poisoned by pesticides that you take time every day in a committed way to sit down by yourself, shut off all your gadgets by yourself, get as still as you can get, breathe as lightly as you can breathe, go as deep, get as deeply still as you can possibly get, see how deep you can go, see how long you can stay there, and pay attention to what's there in that stillness. That's how you discover yourself. And in that stillness, you will find your greatest purpose. And that will be a purpose that is your purpose, not somebody else telling you, oh, you could make a lot of money in real estate, or, oh, you could make a lot of money on this, or, oh, you should become an architect because we've always wanted to have an architect in our family, right? There's all kinds of ways that people tell other people who they should be, but your gift is personal and comes out of your own discovery and has to come out of your own discovery. And then it's clean and then it's like, yeah, and then you discover something like that thing, oh my God, we could help so many people. Oh my God, I could help so many people with this, with oils made with health in mind, right? But it'll be something else for you. It'll be something else for each human being. It's almost like a divine purpose. If you want to, if you, you know, if you want to use spiritual language, what are you good for on this planet? Because you're good for something, right? Yeah. Well, and then the question is, and then it's always going to be something that 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 improves the quality, that gives people more joy or less pain that improves quality of life because life is the, is the gift on the planet. Life is the treasure here. Life, anything that improves quality of life has a market because everybody's something inside of every human being wants to be better, fuller, deeper, happier, wiser, contenter, <laughs> lover, more, more loving. Anything in that arena will be will be a a sustainable purpose lifelong yeah i i could completely agree now <clears throat> well i wanted to ask you because you're what you kind of kind of talk about is in the morning like a type of meditation because i know you talk a lot about like peace and start starting your day with calm calmness which is yeah. what you're talking about now obviously in this day and age there's a lot of unrest yeah there's just so much people have anxiety they have all kinds of stuff that's go going on so what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's li listening who just honestly they kind of feel helpless like i don't know what to do yeah <laughs> well <laughs> well you do know what to do and you're not helpless right but here's the thing that i think and this is where if you look at the turbulence in the world all of that turbulence is on the outside or in our mind. There is no turbulence in the core of your being. In fact, if you want peace in your life, that peace exists already within you. It is the foundation of your existence, and it is the foundation of the, of the entire universe. Same peace. You can experience it in your own life, 
but you have to bring your awareness, which is focused on the outside or in your head most of the time. You have to bring that into the space that your body occupies. And you do one of the easiest ways is you sit down and you and you see how still you can get. You know, when we were kids and we play hide go seek, sometimes I don't know if you did, but yeah, you know, and we would then we would hide in some place and we would be so still that we almost weren't breathing. Do that, right? And then hoping that nobody would hear us because we weren't going. Ah, ah. We weren't talking. You know, we're just sitting so still. We weren't breaking any branches with our feet. You know, we weren't scratching against the wall or anything. So we'd be sitting so still and then just really trying to see how totally still we could become so, so they wouldn't hear us, right? And if you're hidden where they can't see you, they can still hear you if you're not still, right? So that stillness. And then, and then just paying attention to what that is like inside of you. So, in the, so, and what that means is that if you get good at it, we're not that good at it because we're really good at going out with our senses because we do that every day, right? You wake up, you open your eyes, you look around. You know, you hear you, something moves, you look at it. You know, you hear a sound, you, you listen to it, right? What's that? What's that? What's that? And that's survival stuff. You know, we learned that very early in our life. We didn't need that. We didn't know that when we were in our mother's womb. We learned it very early in life because it's required for survival. You have to get to know the world you, you live in. And whenever something changes, you got to pay attention because you got to say, is this a friend? Is this an enemy? Or is this irrelevant? And depending on how you assess the change, you respond to it in the, in the appropriate way. You know, if it's, if it's danger, you run or you fight, if it's, if, it's, uh, if it's friend, then you come closer and embrace it maybe. And if it's irrelevant, you just ignore it, right? So we're really good at doing that because we do it all day long. But we're not very good at bringing our awareness in, inward, inside, to focus inside, because we hardly ever do it. And, and going out is automatic for survival going in has to be deliberate. And the starting point, if you want a starting point, is heartache. Whenever your heart aches, like I'm sure you know what, what I'm talking about. Somebody ever dumped you? You felt heartbroken because you didn't want to get dumped? Yeah, we all. Yeah, yeah, that feeling. Or somebody dies who you were close to. That feeling of sadness, sorrow, grief. Always you feel it in your chest, right? And then sometimes people go and think, you know, get out of their chest and get into their head or get out of their chest and get into their anger or their fear, which is a little downward from, the, from your chest. Always that feeling starts in your chest. Emptiness, restlessness, yearning, searching, hope, hopelessness. There's so many words for that depending on what context we, but that feeling is actually your heart calling your awareness to come back home to your life where your fulfillment, where your wholeness, where your contentment, where your peace live. That thing is calling you all the time, but you get distracted by things. And then when they end, you go, you go back to that place. Oh, I don't feel whole. Oh, I don't feel full. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I lost something. That's another one, feeling of loss. That's the feeling of our loss, of our connection to ourselves. So you start there, and that far behind it is your peace. That far behind it. And so when people, people try to distract themselves from that feeling because they don't like it because it's intense, I say, no, 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 no. Feel it, sit with it, be with it, accept it, really experience it. Don't judge it. Not going to hurt you, not going to kill you. Accept it. Maybe embrace it. Maybe even be grateful for the fact that this feeling keeps calling you home, keeps calling you home to yourself.
because if it wasn't for that feeling, we would get so lost by our distractions, we would never find our way home. And this thing will not let you alone because every time something, every something that you have decided to make dear to you, when that ends, you're back to the heartache. So, so I call heartache the greatest gift you've been given other than being alive because it will call you home. It will, it will continue to call you home until you come home. And when you come home, you discover that you have always been whole, that, your li that life is un incredibly beautiful, that there's peace within you that cannot be shaken by any turbulence other than you going away from it, that your life energy, your life loves your body unconditionally. So you, there you have a, a model for unconditional love. When you feel that, then you feel so cared for that the only thing left to do is how can I help? What needs to be done around here? And that's another way you find your purpose because when you feel taken care of, it, it's not about, you know, most of the things we do is like, I want to do something, but it's got to take care of me, right? So that's, we call it horse trade, right? Business, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. We do it in relationships too. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. What's it like to feel so whole, so full, so content, so rich, so taken care of inside that you can actually give without necessarily asking for something in return? See, because if you want to make the world better, you have to give more than you get. And the only way you can do that is if you already have so much that you don't need anymore. And then you can give and then you can be selfless. Then selflessness works. Well, that's a long, that's a long wrap there. <laughs> no, it's extremely powerful because, yeah, a lot of times what people do is they don't feel their feelings. It's like, I'm feeling sad. That, that's a bad feeling. Or I lost somebody. This is a bad feeling. I can't feel this way. Let me move. They're, they're, they do all these things to escape from that feeling because they think there's something wrong with that feeling. But as you said, I mean, you need to embrace those feelings. If you feel sad, it's, it's a good thing to feel that sad. You're a human being, and yeah. these feelings that you, you're feeling are just like a natural thing that we're supposed to feel. But a lot of times, yeah, we, we escape from these feelings because, you know, we're, we're told by our parents or by society that, you know, feeling like this is bad, there's something wrong with you, when yeah. there's really nothing. You, this is just natural for us. Yeah, the, yeah, the feeling is the starting point. If you want, you know, it's like you want to run it, you, you want to go inside and feel content and feel peace. Well, what, you know, that's the goal. What's your starting point? Where well, your starting point is where you, what you're feeling right now. And the strongest starting point is actually feeling sad or feeling bad. That's where you're starting. If, you do, if you're not willing to put your feet in the blocks for the race, <laughs> you're not going to run the race. Right? Every, every journey has a starting point and a, and a destination. Starting point for this journey, the journey inward, is whatever you're feeling, and especially feeling heartache, contentment or discontent, or sad, or bad, <laughs> or sorry, or, you know, that's your starting point. And peace is the, is the, uh, is the is the goal that's the finish line only that journey of awareness goes inside it's just a journey of awareness because wherever your focus is that becomes your reality so you want to live in the reality of peace it exists within you but your focus has to be in th where it is you know you can't say uh you know i've got money i've got a million dollars in my left pocket and there's nothing in my right pocket and the only place I look for money is in my right pocket. And I feel like I'm poor because <laughs> I can't find it. Well, you have to look for where it is. The peace is in you. The love, unconditional love is in you. The inspiration is in you. Purpose is in you. Richness is in you. You were born with everything. Now, you already know that in a way. Because when you were in your mother's womb, you were in a perfect state. I call it, I call the womb the Buddha tank. So there you were floating around in a little water tank, right? Nothing to do, nowhere to go, everything taken care of, and pretty safe. 
So where was your awareness focused? Well, it didn't have any place to go. So it was folk, it was, it was at rest, your awareness. The focus of your awareness was at rest inside in life. And you were just floating around and your body was growing and you weren't even conscious of your body. You were just in, you were just in the light. You were, you were in a little Buddha. That's it. So you've been a little Buddha for nine months if you were, if you were a term baby. And you were, you were present inside, but absent outside, because there wasn't anything outside you were going to. Then you got born, you went outside, and became present outside and absent inside. That's where your heartache began. And then the dramas and traumas remind you of it, but the heartache began from your disconnection from yourself. It is a part, it is a natural part of every human being's journey. But the homecoming is not automatic. It has to be deliberate. You have to make time because there will always be something that will call your attention on the outside. So that's why you create a safe place where you're not distracted, shut off all of your gadgets, and sit with yourself, sitting still. Now, most people say, when I do that, I'm bored. Okay, just notice how much peace is in your boredom. And when you're bored, it's because you're out of your addiction to doing stuff. And you're not yet in the light, in the sound, in the, in the feeling inside, you know, of life inside. Because if you actually sit down and get really quiet in a dark room, close your eyes. If you look inward deep enough, eventually you'll see light in the darkness. You'll hear sound in your silence. You'll feel love in your emptiness. And you'll even taste sweetness in the blandness of your mouth. That's part of human nature. But you won't know that unless you take your awareness there. And, and there's a way of doing it that works, and there's ways of doing it that doesn't work. If you're always going outside, you're not going inside. Now, now we have COVID, right? Corona, right? A lot of people changed their life, put the whole world on hold. And we have time to be with ourselves. So I say to people, if you can't go outside, go inside. Right? <laughs> you could still go inside. And, uh, and, and, and what is your life about? You know, what is it to be a human being? What does it feel like? What, what would it take to be fully present in all of your being and your surroundings and not tied up in thoughts in your head? That's sort of the cherished state, fully present in all of your being and your surroundings. Then you can respond to whatever happens. And, and it won't be difficult. And it's not going to be based on fear. It's going to be based on wisdom and understanding and recognition because you're actually present in your life and you see what's going on. And then you, ha you have all your resources at your disposal to address what needs to be addressed to bring it back to unturbulence. Now, I have a question about boredom because as an adult, we, we understand that. I mean, what you're making makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we're bored, that's when we become extremely creative. Now, for someone who has children who's listening, you know, kids, we're, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. How, how do you kind of help a child understand that being bored is actually a good thing? Yeah. Well, you, you have to model it. If you're a parent who can't stand boredom, <laughs> you're not going to be a good model for the kid, right? You know, and kids are pretty, by nature pretty active and they need to be active and that's how they get to know the world. So this that's that's not a problem but there's time for stillness for kids too and in fact there are people in in certain places they were they where they teach in school you know we used to call it a time out right you isolate the kid when he's getting too socially <laughs> obstreperous right and then you isolate the kid and you call it a time out but the time out is time where you can actually be with yourself if you use that time properly. 
right? And if you can, if you can learn how to be comfortable just being with yourself, your kid will be comfortable too. If, however, you never comfortable with yourself sitting still and doing nothing, then you're basically going to turn that off for the kid as well. You're going to make it harder for the kid to be able to find their peace because you never did your homework to find yours. It makes sense, yeah. Right? So, so, but you can't, you know, you can't hammer people on the head. I mean, we're talking about it, right? But you can't hammer the kid over the head with words about peace. But kids pick up their state of being. They pick up your state of being or your state of emotion. They pick it up so fast, right? And then you yell at them, you know, and then next thing you know, they're yelling just like you did. You know, they pick it up so fast. I mean, they're learning, they're learning machines. <laughs> why, not, why not also sit still with them? That's, and, yeah, and, and that's a good thing for them. And out of that stillness, yes, is where your creativity comes. So, so that's true. Boredom leads to, you know, but then the creativity becomes part of the distraction. So you want to you want to cultivate being bored and doing nothing about it, because you can always create. But going a little deeper into the boredom, you're going to find even more gifts, even more gifts that are embedded in life become available to you. So that's the thing for a lot a lot of people, especially now with technology, TV, and all this mm -hmm. stuff. We always feel that we always have to do, 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 do something. And yeah. in the second of the day, as you said, it's like, you know, even even people lay in bed with their, their phone or they're going yeah. to the bathroom. Yeah. Hey, I, I got I got to go to the bathroom. I got to look at my phone. It's like they're so addicted to everything that they constantly yeah. start having to do yeah. something. But it's just a habit. It, and it is an addiction. So, you know, I my view is that if you do, 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 you turn into do, do. <laughs> right and so what i say and but to be serious about it you know being and doing which one's more important being, being or doing <laughs> being being why because you can be without doing but you can't do without being so being is your foundation and if you want to live your life without without foundation <laughs> then be a doer <laughs> you know <laughs> then Right. And then a lot of times when people ask, like the question you ask, well, how do you do that? You know, how do you do being? <laughs> you have to stop doing. Do nothing to be. Right. But most people will say, well, you know, teach me what I need to do <laughs> to be. And you have to actually undo. But that's, that's just an indication of how addicted we are to doing. Yeah. You know, the other way, you know, to look at it, it's like if I say to you, hey, whose body is that? Johnny, whose body is that? My <laughs> point of view. What, are, what are you saying? Mine. <laughs> it's my body, right? You know what you've just told me? You've, you've just told me that you're not the body. You're not that body. You just told me it's my body. So that means the body is your possession. That means you are the owner of the body. Just like somebody says, hey, whose watch is that? You know, I say, oh, well, that's my watch. Well, I'm not the watch. The watch, I own the watch, right? So you've just told me that about your body. Wow. So you are the owner of the body. So then who are you? So who owns your body? It's a good question. Yeah. So, so can I tell you? Yes. No, you have to wait two hours. You have to think about it first. No, 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 no I'm kidding. Uh, no, so life is the owner of your body. Now, you know that too, because you know that when life and the body separate, the body's finished. But what you're also saying, and what that also means, is you are not the body, you are life. And life weighs nothing and runs everything in your body. It is omnipresent in your body, 
Omnipresent means present everywhere. It is omniscient. It knows everything you're, about your body. <clears throat> That's why it, you know, it can run 60 trillion cells all at the same time. Make sure they're all fed. Make sure all the wastes are removed. <clears throat> Make sure your heart keeps beating when you're sleeping. Make sure that even if you're freaking out about what's going on in the world, all of your inside functions are still taking place. So life is doing all of that. So omni, uh, no, all-knowing, and it's all-powerful. All power in you is life. Where does that life come from? The sun, sunlight, stored in bonds between atoms in molecules. You eat those, release the light. The, that light is your life. You are sunlight. You are light. You are life. And life is the master in you. Now, when you talk about the great masters, Buddha and Krishna and Christ and all of those guys, they were talking about, not about, I'm a cool guy and you're, you're, you're a sucker. They were saying, what is in me is in you. The master lives in every human being. That master lives in every human being. And that master, if you're not religious, is just called life or life energy. Wow. Or sunlight. But the difference is, you know, the scientists study sunlight, sunlight from the outside. And there's a difference between seeing light and being light. When you bring your awareness inside in touch with the light that you are, you're going into being the light instead of just seeing the light. So one is subjective. Being the light is subjective and seeing the light is objective. So we know a lot about light, light from the outside and how fast it travels and that it can be a wave and a particle and all of the stuff that, that scientists have learned by watching what light does, right? But they don't know what light is. You know, even, even in, in science, you know, we're, we're into doing and, and we really don't have a handle on what things are, even though we say it, but we don't. And that, you know, what you are is what is, is about being, you know, and not in words, but in direct experience. What does it feel like to be life? It's beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On, on good days, it feels really good. <laughs> right. But then it, on, on, you know, and what it feels like is not conditional on your body either that's powerful now i wanted to ask you a little bit about oils because you know yeah. one, <laughs> one 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 thing i so i i have, I have a degree in health and fitness management yes and, I one, and one thing i've learned is a lot of people do not know how to read labels when they go to the store a lot of times they don't even yeah. look at the label so for anybody who's listening what oils heal and what oils really kill a person anytime you fry oils they, they become killers frying is the worst thing we ever invented to do with oils with foods generally but with oils especially because in the most sensitive molecules they have the most energy they are the most easily damaged and become toxic and they should get the most care but we give them the least care we don't throw anything in the frying pan all by itself and, and watch it turn into smoke and you know, if you turn it into smoke, you've changed the chemistry. Yes. So frying is number one. Number two is the uh, trans fatty acids. And everybody knows about those now, but they were in the food supply for a hundred years plus, a hundred years plus before uh, Harvard University blew the whistle on them. And Walter Willett and his groups showed how bad they are. Now you have to label them and, at least in some places in, in, you know, so that's, that's number two. And those are twisted molecules that just don't do the job that a, an oil is supposed to do in your body. Number three is the, the industrial oils because they're treated with harsh chemicals, uh, sodium hydroxide and phosphoric acid or Drano and window washing acid. Then they're bleached and turn rancid. Then they are cooked, boiled, deodorized, heated to frying temperature to get rid of the rancidity. 
to make the colorless, odorless, tasteless oils. Those oils, in a tablespoon of an oil like that, you have 60 quintillion damaged molecules. I ask people in my lectures sometimes, how many, how many damaged molecules do you think you might have in an oil if the oil is 1% damaged? They always, their estimate is always a billion times too low. And uh, then, I, then I ask him, if, I, if you were going to get on a plane and somebody you knew that you could trust told you, oh, by the way, your chance of crashing and dying on this plane ride is a billion times higher than you thought it was, would you get on the airplane? Oh, no. No. So, and I say that because given that we underestimate how damaged the oils are before we even fry them by a billion times. Is that enough of an incentive for you to say, I'm not going to use those oils anymore? I need oils made with health in mind. Where do you get them? Seeds and nuts or oils made with health in mind. And that's an industry I pioneered, you know, after my pesticide poisoning and getting really excited about how many people I could help. And out of that came flax seed oil, which is a poorly balanced oil. And out of that came a blend that we could develop because it's better balanced. And then the, the third, the fourth toxic oils are saturated fats if you're not getting enough of the omega-6 and omega-3 essential fatty acid. Because what happens is uh, saturated fats will make your platelets more sticky and will make you more insulin resistant. But omega-3s make you more insulin sensitive and make platelets less sticky. So saturated fats are a problem only when you have not optimized your omega-3 intake. And 99% of the population hasn't done that. So, so those are the four. And then the, the, to turn it around, the only thing you need from fats that's essential is omega-3 and omega-6 essential fatty acid. Your body can make the fish oils if you get the foundation containing enough plant-based omega-3s. Right? Omega-3 and 6 are not supplements. You have to dis distinguish between the food oil foundation, which, which is damaged that needs to be changed. So your body needs an oil change just like the car. Right? You take the dirty oil out, you put clean oil in. So, uh, and then you can take a supplement in addition to that. Sometimes that can be helpful. But this supplement can't fix, with, fix what's wrong with your foundation. So you can't just dump a good supplement on a bad foundation and get it fixed. You have to get the foundation fixed by changing the foundation. And then a supplement can, can be an add-on. But you cannot do, you know, I, fish oil is not enough oil for human beings. We, we need a lot of oil in comparison to other creatures. You know, our body is usually, if you're pretty good shape, 8% body fat. You know, most people have more body fat than that. And it's our energy storage. Mm -hmm. These are the high energy molecules. Omega-3 is the highest energy molecule. If energy is God, then, then omega-3 is the God molecule, right? Because you get more, it turns on energy production in the body. It turns off fat production in the body. And you get stable energy, but a high level of energy, better than on carbs. You know, we had athletes running marathons. We used to always run them on carbs. The carb load for two days. Problem is you only store one pound of carbs in the body. And at 20, mile 20, you're out of carbs. And they couldn't take sugar drinks and stuff with them in the days when, when we started this. So we said to them, no, no, you need to carb deplete, run the whole race on fats. Take your omega-3s because they will increase your fat burning mechanism. And that was really out of the box when we started doing that. Few people tried it and they said, oh my God, that was incredible. When I finished the marathon, I felt like I had enough energy to run another marathon. Wow, that's good. Whereas, whereas on carbs, they, could, they would always hit the wall at 20 miles and then drag their butt the last six miles. But the only thing you need is omega-3 and omega-6. And because they're really sensitive, they need to be made with health in mind. 
You either get them from seeds and nuts or you get them from oils made with house and mind. How, how do they heal? The athletes we worked with and the reports we got from athletes is omega-3s decrease the time it takes athletes to heal from injuries to a third to a half the time. And that's just because they give the, the cells more energy to do their work. They also, when we work with athletes, if they took a tablespoon per 50 pounds of body weight per day, mixed in food, and intake spread out over the, over the day, so it's usually two to four tablespoons for most people, of Udo's oil, within 30 days, they had 40 to 60% improvement in their performance if they did their performance to exhaustion. So that's how we did the study. So uh, do your sport to exhaustion, figure out what that is, go on the oil for 30 days and do your sport to exhaustion again. They have 40 to 60% increase in stamina on average. That's incredible. That's huge. You can't, there's no training program that'll do that for you. And it make your skin really nice and increase IQ by three to nine points. <laughs> Studies on that. Elevate mood, lift depression, because the body makes uh, endo endocannabinoids out of oils and protein. So then you don't have to smoke a joint to get high. You, you, get, high on, <laughs> you get high on your food. <laughs> Now, speaking of like cooking oil, so would a person, yeah. if a person's going to have oil, obviously they need to have it raw, mm -hmm. but if they're going to cook with something, what should yeah. they use then? Because as you're saying, you're taking oil and you're destroying it. So what, 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 if they're going to cook with something, what would you recommend if they're going to? Well, yeah, people ask me, what oil can I use for cooking? I say water. <laughs> Water is the only oil you should use for cooking. Well, water, of course, is not an oil, right? But here, you know, I'm 78. So when I was a kid in uh, Europe, we left there when I was 10. And when I came to Canada, and probably for another 10, 15 years, mostly when people cooked, they cooked in water. The idea of cooking everything in oil, we call that frying. Now it's called cooking. Cooking, when I was a kid, meant the use of water for heating food. When you cook in water, you don't dry out the food and it don't burn it. When you cook in oil, everything that turns, you know, first it's caramelized and then it turns brown and then it turns black and then it turns into smoke. All of that stuff is toxic. Wow. When you overheat carbs, they, you increase your risk of inflammation and cancer. When you overheat protein, you increase your risk of inflammation and cancer. And when you overheat oils, you increase your risk of inflammation and cancer. And inflammation, as you know, is behind many of our major degenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and, of course, the, the uh, rheumatic diseases, arthritic diseases, and diabetes. Uh, inflammation is involved in all of those as, a, as, as a, a background factor. And frying gets you that no matter what you fry. You know, you burn your vegetables and you fry the fiber and fry the whatever you got in your vegetables. Increase inflammation and cancer. Incle increase risk of inflammation and cancer. So the frying is the dumbest thing we ever learned to do with food the most destructive, the most health hostile thing we've ever done to ourselves is frying. So I tell people, get your frying pan out wherever you got it, because everybody has one. <laughs> Turn it upside down, hit yourself on the head with it really hard so it's associated with pain, and then throw that stupid thing out and go back to cooking in water. And let me put that in perspective. If you look at nature, nature's mandate for every creature was fresh, whole, raw, organic for millions of years. Fresh, whole, raw, organic. When you cook in water, you're already off of that. So you're going to lose some minerals into the water and you're going to make some of the amino acids uh, partially damaged and um, some of the more sensitive vitamins may be partially damaged and your proteins coagulate and they're harder to digest you know so you're already making differences that affect your health 
you're making changes, but it's less damage. You know, when you fry, you get all of those problems, but you also, you also make the molecules unnatural, change them from natural to unnatural, and many of those are toxic. That's why you get inflammation and cancer. So like, for example, somebody who loves to eat eggs, then they would be better off boiling, making a hard boiled egg versus frying an egg? Well, you could soft, well, first of all, the fox will eat the egg raw, right? <laughs> that, that's a possibility too. And we used to, when I was a kid, we used to take eggs off the farm and we'd punch a hole in one end, punch a hole in the other end and just suck it out raw. Wow. No, we didn't, you know, we did it because we were on the farm and yeah, it was kind of, it's kind of, you know, you get used to it. It's a little slimy, but you get used to it. But you can soft boil, hard boil, you can water scramble. Right, and you can poach, so it's not like you can't do your eggs without oil. You know, people sometimes say to me, "Oh, but I love the taste of burnt meat." No, you don't. <laughs> you know, my answer is no, you don't, because if you scrape that stuff off of your meat and you get a tablespoon of it, and then you eat that burnt stuff, it squeaks between your teeth like chalk on the blackboard. It's acrid, it's bitter, and it tastes disgusting, and it kills you. <laughs> And it'll kill you, but, but it's not even fun going in. A lot of stuff is like, it's stuff we do based on the way that we grew up. Like our mom and dad made it this way. Yeah. So that's why, like, I, I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My, my whole family's yeah. from Europe. But here in the South, everybody fries every single thing, usually. Everywhere. E everywhere in the world, everybody now fries everything. But the thing is, how did that happen? The industry became, you know, it started, the industry really just started around 1900, the big industry, the big oil industry. It's now a hundred billion dollars a year. It's like a big industry around the world. And they, they wanted to have a long shelf life. They weren't looking to, to make oils with health in mind. They wanted to have oils have a long shelf life because then you could make it in Vancouver and sell it in Milwaukee <laughs> or sell it in Johannesburg or sell it in Tokyo. Because then you have a big market if you have a two or three year shelf life. So they figured out to do that, you treat it with Drano, with window washing acid, bleach it, then heat it to frying tempera temperature to deodorize the rancid stink. And so that's how they made the oils. And then it was like, oh, oh my God, what if we used oils for cooking? Then we would get oil in every home. And if people used oil instead of water for cooking, we'd make a lot of money. And th so they bamboozled your parents or your grandparents, depending on how old you are, bamboozled them into changing from cooking in water to frying. People will ask me sometimes, well, what do you do? Uh, you, how do you do your steak in, if you're boiling? I said, well, we used to cut it in cubes and threw it in the stew with the vegetables and the spices. Tasted really good. Wasn't burnt. Was awesome. Goulash. <laughs> yeah, goulash, right. <laughs> For instance, uh, one, just one example. Russian, huh? Uh, no, my father, his family's from Hungary. His what? My father's family's from Hungary. Hungary? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah goulash is a, is a Hungarian thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Borscht, borscht is the Russian thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's not a requirement. And, and remember, sushi is raw, and Japs live longer than <laughs> anybody. <laughs> Right, and why is that? Because when you don't cook the proteins, they're much easier to digest. And so, so, and every creature, every other creature other than human beings eats all their meat. If they eat meat, they eat it raw. Your dog doesn't cook it, you know, a wolf doesn't cook its uh, rabbits, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, and then sometimes people would argue, well, a dog has a different stomach, their body's designed to handle oh. that kind of stuff, and yeah. Well, that's true, uh, uh, and their yeah, their gut is shorter, and they they have cutting teeth, so the the meat's not in there, so it doesn't putrefy like it does in a longer gut, like it would in a longer gut. That means we should be eating less meat than the wolf. That's all that means, right? And we have chewing teeth. That means we need to do some chewing, so we don't just wolf down our food. So we're a little bit more like the the plant eaters that way. And we fundamentally, uh, for humans, the longest life and the, and the healthiest life, healthiest body, come from eating fresh whole raw organic, but also mostly plant-based. 
when the hunters had rocks to hunt with in the Stone Age. That's why it's called the Stone Age. They only had rocks to hunt with, right? <laughs> they didn't come home with meat very often because the animals ran away or hid or fought back or whatever. And if they didn't have meat, they had vegetables because they don't run away and they don't fight back and they're easy to hunt down and kill. So we were not hunter-gatherers. We were mostly gatherer-hunters. And, and so... Um, so that's the other issue, you know, they, they ate meat maybe four times a year or 12 times a year, like once a month, they had a little meat or they ate an animal and gorged on meat, but then they had no meat for three months, six months, right? It was not because you, they didn't have refrigeration, so you couldn't freeze your steaks, right? So they had to eat the meat fresh and, uh, you know, a, a pig or whatever you whatever you uh, whatever you kill <clears throat> doesn't last very long if you have if you don't have a way to keep it. If you ate meat four times a year, you would get enough B12 for your body's requirement. It requires it. It comes from animal products. Uh, there's some people say it comes from certain bacteria, but we don't have a reliable bacterial source for it. So four times a year, not bacon for breakfast and then sausages for lunch and then steak for dinner every day. So, uh, so what we're doing is, is out of line with how it was in nature before we got civilized. And we, per, we pay a price for that. Every step you get out of line with nature, you pay a price. Yeah, no, and so, so, so it was just the, the, the whole thing of frying just was, was ba they bamboozled our parents and our grandparents said, oh, it, it's more convenient. Oh, it doesn't take so long. Oh, we're going to make life easier. And my view is that it, whenever you hear the word convenient, you should run like hell. <laughs> because convenience will always tear you down. Because challenges is what makes you stronger. Right? Same with vaccination. You know, vaccination is, is a convenience. You know, because peop then people don't have to deal with... with um, you know, with the time it takes a kid to get through smallpox or, or, or whooping cough, 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 or whatever, whatever the situation is. But it has, there are many side effects that have not seen the light of day. So we're being told to do something. It's an industrial thing. Uh, there's lots of issues with vaccination. And the, and the idea of mandatory vaccination, and you know, the, vaccina the, the, the vaccines are not tested for safety the way they should be tested, and you can't sue the ma vaccine manufacturers. You can sue the government, but you can't sue the manufacturer. So there's a lot of issues around vaccination that uh, it, while it's convenient and of course makes a lot of money for, for certain industries, while it may be convenient, there are lots of side effects and it doesn't make you stronger. It actually makes you weaker in, in many ways. So there's lots of, I mean, you know, and, and we think, we think convenience is, is, is to, you know, make life easy. Life, life, and you know what? <laughs> then you get the convenience and your life is still not easy. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, just for example, Five, six o'clock, drive past, past the fast food restaurants here in the United States. I mean, you will see those lines. They will be so yeah. long. Yeah. You know, where most of us, we grew up in families where people sat at the table. I mean, like, I remember my, we, we used to go to farmer's market. My mom would start making dinner at like maybe 11 o'clock in the morning, picking green yeah. beans and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, don't really do that anymore. Yeah. And there, and there's a price price we pay you know it's in terms of lots of lots of i mean there are psychological issues with it as well because eating together was was a good way for the family to spend time together you know and helping to cook was training you know and if you had to, if you were growing your own food then it, the kids learned about natural cycles and about patience and and about how the earth works and soils work and weeds <laughs> don't work, right? And all of that. And my view is if you have a house, 
you should tear up your lawn and grow vegetables and, and, and fruits. But both because that'll be the freshest food you'll ever have because fresh food is not fresh anymore either. It's like three years old. If you're my oranges from come to Vancouver, come from Florida, probably two weeks old. And some of them have no vitamin C in them and they have to be picked unripe. And there's all kinds of issues in, in that kind of, in non-local, I would hi highly recommend for people from a health perspective to do what they can to grow their own vegetables and to grow their own spices because yeah. the convenience, I mean, you know, we're destroying the planet with our convenient living and we're destroying our politics and we're destroying our relationships and we're destroying our own health with yeah. our conveniences. Absolutely. And well, and the sad thing is it doesn't have to be that way. And you just like, like you said, what you are, it's especially here in the United States, people have so much, all this space where you could theoretically grow a lot of stuff. Yeah. But it's convenient to go to the store and buy a, uh, a tomato that really tastes like probably paper. Cause I, I, I actually do grow a lot of my own stuff and you know, it has, it tastes so much better when it's fresh. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also the soil, you know, we eat the, we eat the food, we, we dump in the toilet, the toilet takes it down the, into the river. So we're dead basically flushing the topsoil into the, into the rivers and the ocean. So there's a lot of good topsoil in the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean, right? And we're, to, we're being told now that there's only 60 years of topsoil left on this planet. 60 years, because we, because everything we eat, you know, the plant took from the soil, right? 20 minerals, we put three of them back, sometimes six. The other, the other 14, we don't put back. And, you can, and how long can you do that? <laughs> and we've been doing it for a long time. So there's, there's lots of issues and it's all about convenience. The sides we use, it was supposed to make it convenience for, convenient for the farmer. And we get pesticides in our food. So there's 14 minerals that's in the soil, you're saying? No, there are tw 20. Okay. Depends so on who you are. There was, there's like more than that. It's like, <clears throat> how many minerals are there? There are 92 elements, naturally occurring elements. Uh, of those, uh, probably 50, 50 are minerals, right? Yeah. You find all of that in the soil in trace amounts or larger amounts, but the plant will take about 20 minerals out of the soil. We eat that plant, we get some of those minerals, but then whatever is left in the plant, because we don't get all of that, that goes in the toilet and then that goes in, into the water right into the river. That's why you can't drink the Mississippi water. Yeah. <laughs> it's all toilet water, <laughs> right? And then if you live on the ocean, we, we dump ours in Vancouver, we dump it in the ocean. There's our top, that's our top soil. So what I'm saying is, you know, we got the, this cooking thing wrong. We should be cooking our wastes to kill the parasites and put the waste back on land. And we should be eating the food raw, right? So what we're doing is we're cooking the food and, <laughs> and, and not putting the, 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 the remainder back on the land. So if you do want to replace things, so if you have a garden at your house and you're growing things, but you want to put things back into the soil, what yeah. are some ways that you can do that? Well, you blend, blend them and dig them in. Right. We also throw all our orange peels and our, you know, the, the, the ends of our broccolis and, you know, the flower, the, the parts that are started to rot, you know, we put those in the garbage and then the truck picks up the garbage and they put it in one dump. All that stuff could go back in the garden. So right? the way to dig the, and then if you're doing it at yeah. small scale, then you can put, then you can put all that, all that stuff in a blender, like a Vitamix or something. And just blend it up and then mix that with the dirt yeah okay yeah or you make a little compost box right you throw it in there and it ferments and the earthworms go in there and they munch it up and then you you move it a couple of times it takes about takes about six months to a year to make the compost so to have a compost box uh that would be a good way to turn soil you know, turn plants back into soil 
and then you put them in the in the in the soil. Good to know. So that's about a one one year process. Yeah, about I turn it three times. You know, you put the you put the garbage the the, the uh, plant garbage in a box, and then I I had three boxes. I did it for a co-op, 90, 90 units. So put the put the garbage in put the plant garbage in so no plastic bags and all like all of that stuff ferment it then took take it to the next box then take it to the next box by the time it's gone through three boxes it's it's, it's uh you could use it in the soil it's basically soil again and it's free <laughs> it's free and well and well you took it out of the soil you, so you're just putting it back to where you got it <laughs> right yeah yeah, because a lot, a lot, a lot of times after people garden, you know, the stuff that's dead, they just like throw, throw it in the trash or they'll yeah. put it somewhere so it can rot, but they don't really do anything with it. Yeah, that's good to know. Now, yeah. I want, I wanted to ask you. So, as, as you mentioned earlier, I mean, you've literally have done thousands and thousands of interviews. You traveled the world. What have you learned about people and about yourself through these experiences? Mm. Well, it's not the traveling. I, I can tell you this. I think that probably the most important general message is that our way of organizing ourselves doesn't work. Our leadership model does not work. You know, you have one guy that works for like little tribes. You have one guy who's with big cojones, right? And he's the leader of the pack, right? That works until you have about 150 people. It doesn't work when you have 330 people or in Canada, 36 million people. And in, in US, 330 million or whatever it is. It doesn't work. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's because the guy who's in the White House, no matter who he is, cannot be on top of the needs of 330 million individuals, right? So the best thing that guy could do would be to inspire people to pick up shovels and, you know, do the work they need to do in their own life. But that's not what we have. So what is a better model? The leader is life. Every human being on this planet has that leader living inside of them. If you want to know how to live better, ask life. How do you ask life? It's closer to you than your breath. It's closer to you than your nose. Talk to yourself, right? And whatever you call that, whether you call it life or the master or the leader or the president, you know, life is the president the owner, the president, the CEO of, of your body. Talk to it. And how do you talk to it? Sit still. You don't even talk to it. Well, you can talk. I mean, you can ask your questions. The questions you have to ask the expert, ask those of your life. Because the experts, if they have anything good to say, had to get it somewhere. And if they're just quoting books that were wrong <laughs> over and over, generation after generation. No, where does the original knowledge come from? It comes from inside of human beings. Einstein's stuff, you know, he said, he said 99 times I think and think and think and I get nothing. <laughs> and then I, and then I, and then I f sit still and float in silence and the answer comes to me. So we have all the answers we need built into us. They're all embedded in life. So in that way, we need to become more independent of other people's opinions. I mean, it's, it's good. Sometimes people have good things to say. But for the really important questions of how should I live, you need to turn to yourself. And imagine if 330 million people in the U.S. talked to the master within them talk to life within them, talk to the leader within them, felt taken care of. Do you think we'd have all those conflicts that we have? No. Do you think we'd, do you think we'd be being as stupid in the world as we are? No, because, you know, in the end, it's not, 
in the end, it's not whether you're, whether you're the dominant power in the world. In the end, it's about whether human beings have, have, have quality in their short existence. Right? You know, for, for billions of years, you didn't exist. Now you get maybe 100 years if you're lucky. And then for billion years of that, you won't exist again. What, what do you want to do with this 100 years you got? Well, my view is I want it to be the most fulfilling, ecstatic, um, loving, content feeling that's possible. How do I make the most of this short thing? The fact that, that I'm, I exist in a human body for now. It's a temporary, you know, it's a terminal condition. The human body is a terminal condition. In the end, no matter what your great what your great things are, you die. Well, then what's the point of life? To fully, fully, fully enjoy that gift that you have for this short time. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's more an internal thing than an external thing. External, you you deal with with all the things you got to deal with. But how about being present in it too? Because that's where all of your fulfillment is. All of the things you think you can get from the outside, from money and from fame and from power and all of that. Everything you're looking for on the outside, you already have on the inside. So I would say biggest piece of advice, become more present in your own life. It's an awesome, awesome, magnificent gift that you were given. Because you didn't even earn it, you get more given. <laughs> yeah, that's so absolutely true. Because I mean, that, that seems like sometimes we forget. It's like, do you have any idea how lucky you are to be alive? Yeah, really. <laughs> and especially in this day and age, because it's like there's really no reason for anything. It's like you have so much opportunity to do things. Yeah. You know, lot lot like that back when you were growing up as a kid, it's like, yeah, really, it's just surviving. Now you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. It's like, right. you can go exactly. to any store, you can grow any food you want, you can do all these things. There's really no reason why you can't be healthy. Right. You can go on YouTube, you can do so much research. There's so much opportunity to do things. Yeah, and now that you're not, not busy surviving, you could be thriving. Because you know, if you and and if you're just living in survival mode, you know, guess what? You're gonna fail. <laughs> you're not gonna survive, right? So why not make this in this this experience that you know is gonna end up in non-existence? Why not make it the most incredible and and the incredible is built into it? That's what's so cool about it. it the incredible is built into it. So why not thrive? until you crash instead of sitting there saying, oh, I'm going to crash, I'm going to crash, and then crash. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's kind of, I mean, you think about it. It's like we're stupid the way we, the way we do it. Oh, it's for survival. Oh, yes. And then, and then we create crises to keep in survival mode. That's how people most easily control. That's how governments most easily control citizens and how – these leaders, these crazy leaders, cult leaders, of whatever it is, religious leaders, there are all kinds of them, government leaders, politicians, that's how they control people. Create a crisis, create fear, and then people give up their focus on enjoying life and do the stupid things you want them to do. Now, we're going to start unwinding, but just to talk yeah. about leadership, like everybody yeah. needs to understand that yeah, and these people who we call leaders, we are leaders. How can a person be the best leader of their own life and as their individual self? Right. Obviously, you can't, the best, the way to be a best leader is to be fully present in all of your being. Because then you bring all of your potential to the situation. Right? And it begins with leading your life, thinking for yourself observing for yourself, experimenting for yourself in the little things that go on in your life. 
and the wisdom comes from number one, presence, and number two, paying attention to what's going on on the outside as well. You know, you're, you're born like you were conceived with the potential of a master. Every human being, every human being, because it's in us, life, the light, the energy. It knows how to dance from molecule to molecule and make a whole human body, six, 60 trillion cells work together for the common welfare. Maybe we should all study biology. So how do they do that? How come, you know, how come 60 trillion cells can work together without much problem? And we can't even get along with ourselves. <laughs> right? And of what is it? Why is it? Because cells don't have opinions. And they don't think opinions are more important than work. And uh, they take what they need and they give what they have. They share what they have. Every cell does some work, right? And no cell tries to be more important than any other cell. Wow. We can learn a lot from our bodies. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. No kidding. And we've only got 8 billion people. So a thousand times, like one, what is that? One one hundredth of a percent of the number of people compared to the number of cells in one body. And the body can do it and we can't. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe we need to shut up and listen. Yeah. And pay attention and, and observe how it's done. What cells do that we don't do. Give up, do, give up doing some of the things we do that cells don't need to do in order to have harmony. Yeah, we get to listen to our bodies more. Now, as, as we while wind on down, I want to ask you, like, what, what are three very, very important messages you want people to take away from this podcast? Mm-hmm. Okay, now, number one, get present in your own life and enjoy it. Number two, live in line with nature much as you can, especially when it comes to food, water, and air. And I would say number three, find your purpose. Find your personal purpose in from within you by sitting still. And then live that purpose. You know, because on the one hand, you want to thrive and you want to be fully present. On the other hand, you contribute something to the rest of life as well. That's your purpose. So what is that for you? Do that. Don't get a job at minimum wage. <laughs> but all possible. <laughs> Udo, how can people find you online? How can they find your books? How can they sign up for your courses? How can they buy your products and all that? Yeah, I have a I have a website. Uh, I have two websites. One is on products because I work with oils, but also digestive enzymes and probiotics and a few other things. That website is udoschoice.com. U-D-O-S choice.com. I have a second website where we do courses and education and, and other things. It's called The Udo, T-H-E-U-D-O, The Udo.com. Uh, my book you can find on Amazon. Uh, Amazon sells the oil blend, Udo's oil. It's usually in the, uh, you find it in a brown glass bottle, in a box, in a fridge, in the supplement section in the health food stores and uh, or you get it on amazon Uh, you keep it refrigerated once you open it use it within eight weeks if it's closed i keep mine in the freezer it freezes solid Uh, oil shrinks when it freezes so you don't break the bottles the glass bottles water expands and it'll break the glass bottles Uh, people ask me that all the time and once you take it out if you keep it refrigerated it's good for a couple years once you open it, use it up within eight weeks because air gets in and then it gradually starts to react. And mix it in food, spread it out over the course of the day. Goes in any food, don't use it for frying, but you can put it in hot soup and on steamed vegetables and all of that kind of stuff. 
That's good. Yeah, I didn't realize it's better to put oil in the refrigerator. Don't put it in like a, you know, usually people put it up inside their their cabinets or whatnot. Yeah, no. Well, that's okay for olive oil. Although olive oil has some some pretty nasty aftertaste because they're not taking care of it. No, no. Udo's oil is refrigerated in the factory, in the stores. If it ships for more than two weeks, like to Europe and Asia, it's refrigerated during shipping. And once you buy it, you, you put it, I buy it by the case. I have to pay for my oil too. Uh, I buy it by the case, stick it in my freezer, take out the bottle I'm using, I put it in the fridge and use, yeah, I keep it in the fridge. That's good. That's great to know. Yeah. yeah because these are really sensitive, you know, it's kind of like your vegetables. You don't, Put your, you don't put your vegetables in, next to the olive oil in the <laughs> cupboard, right? You keep them in the fridge. These are perishable. This is perishable stuff. That's great to know. So they say, what, what did they say? Eat things that spoil, just eat them before they do. <laughs> right? That's good. Well, Udo, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. It has been such a pleasure to have you on the Power of Your Voice podcast, man. I have really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Johnny here. Thank you for listening to the Power Your Voice podcast. I would absolutely love to get your feedback on this episode and how it impacted you. Reach out to me on Instagram by sending a direct message to username Voice Podcast. If someone in your life could benefit from this episode, share it with them and check out thepowerofyourvoice.com to read blogs on each podcast episode and learn more about what was discussed. And please, Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This lets me know you find this show valuable. And thank you for listening.